So, as somebody that worked at Central State, you believe that there are things that happened there in the past that they really don't want to talk about and never really recorded? Yes. And you would definitely consider Central State to be haunted? Absolutely. Guaranteed. Something's wrong. Something happened. The stuff that went on there, you know, people getting killed, people getting mistreated. When you were working there, there was cannibalism? Yes, a lot of cannibalism. There are at least 20,000 graves that are unmarked. Really, anywhere that you walk, you could very well be standing on someone's final resting place. thinking for a while about when the right time to release this video is, if I should release this video, if it's too shocking, if I could get into any trouble, what this means, but the time has finally come. This, this is a scary video. We went to Central State Asylum looking to ghost hunt, but in doing our ghost hunts, we have uncovered something much darker, much more troubling. Something that the government, people in the town don't want you to know. Yeah, I think the time has finally come. This is a, this is a very dark one. I don't think you're gonna believe what you're seeing and hearing. I guess, uh, let's just do this. institutions and I think that we have a situation that borders on uh, a snake pit and that the children live in Bill. The doctor invited me to see the conditions he was talking about, so unannounced and unexpected by the school administration, we toured building number six. The doctor had warned me that it would be bad. It was horrible. There was one attendant for perhaps 50 children lying on the floor naked and smeared with their own feces. They were making a pitiful sound, the kind of mournful wail that it's impossible for me to forget. This is what it looked like, this is what it sounded like, but how can I tell you about the way it smelled? It smelled of filth, it smelled of disease, and it smelled of death. We've just seen something that's probably the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. It's that typical of ward life. Yes, there are thousands there like that, not going to school, sitting on the ward all day, not being talked to by anyone, only one or two or three people to take care of 70 people on the ward, sharing the same toilet, contracting the same diseases together. One of the requirements for continued eligibility is that there be 80 square feet of space per patient. Here they get only 35 square feet. To these people, life is just one hour after another. Of kind of looking at the floor. There's no training going on here. These kids, there's no effort. We don't know what these kids are capable of doing. The state provides a fair minimum, just enough so that they can call this place a school. Their life is just uh, hours and hours of endless nothing to do, no one to talk to, no expectations, just a, a, an endless life of misery and, and filth. What kind of place this is? Yes, it's a mental hospital for mentally disturbed people such as myself. Hey everybody, my name's Colin Brown. You may know me as the host of the Paranormal Files on YouTube, the channel that you're watching this video on right now. I've been doing this for years, literally, since uh, I was a kid. There's a video of me running through a cemetery as a child wearing a Gap hoodie and some denim jeans. But this video is different. On the night that we're filming this interview, we are at Central State Hospital in Georgia, a massive complex of asylum buildings that was once the largest asylum on the planet. There are over 200 buildings, 200 in this complex. And obviously, as you know, with asylums, there were years, decades of suffering that took place here in a lot of these buildings. There were suicides, 
violent incidents, abuse, rampant abuse, which is why most asylums in America were shuttered. And this almost entire complex is abandoned, but it's truly a once in a lifetime opportunity to be able to investigate Central State. And we were there all night tonight. That's, uh, we've got some pretty scary stories to share from what happened tonight. Hey everybody, uh, Jeff, AKA Papa Spooks, uh, Colin's dad. Uh, yeah, just, I do these trips with Colin for fun and to support him. And this happens to be the first asylum really that I've done with him so far. And right when we got here, I had, I mean, it was really creepy for me. I, I felt like, uh, man, it's massive. First of all, decrepit vines growing on the buildings and uh, just a, a creepy feel all over the place, everywhere we went for me. Asylum in the world. <laughs> Literally the long road to insanity. Think of the old days. It was just like popping, man. We're gonna stay, you know, right there. But I mean, we're gonna stay in one of the administrators' homes yeah. while it was functioning. It's an Airbnb now. Wow. Wow. Oh my god. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Wow, look at this. Wow. My God! Look at these buildings. Look at that! Look at that! Jesus! That's the spookiest place. Okay, he is right here. Holy shit, man! This is oh, huge. Oh my God! Look at that. Well, here we are. Wow, this is insane. Just got to Central State. Yeah. And crazy. We got to wear these orange safety. Yeah. Uh, uniforms. And they have security all over. Yep. Yeah, they are right there. They know that we're here, though. This is like I don't know how you could get larger. This is a this is a, what do they call it? This is the what part of the campus? But there's the, the prison historic quad. It, it's a it's a city on its own, like you know. It really water tower, police, fire department, everything. Yeah. And if you guys can imagine, it goes way back there, here, way all through all of this area. No, it doesn't. So we arrived at Central State Hospital earlier today before we did our investigation. And the sun was setting. We got there a little late because we were filming last night a whole different video. And we initially met with a man by the name of Walter. Now, Walter's a city councilman for nearby Milledgeville, which is a small town that at one point in the history of Central State was smaller than the asylum that was on the border of the town. And Walter came out, gave us a tour of the grounds, laid out the rules. We had to have a film permit insurance to film here. And he told us some pretty interesting history about Central State. Three, two, one, go for it. My name is Walter Reynolds and I am uh, the city councilman for District 4 for the city of Milledgeville. Uh, the downtown district and I'm um, the fourth generation of my family to work here on the Central State Hospital campus. Uh, the State Hospital has such a huge uh, and vital role in the history of Milledgeville. First of all, it was, of course, one of the largest employers uh, in the community, uh, really a regional employer. Uh, thousands and thousands of people worked here on this campus uh, throughout its history. Uh, and, and brought many visitors from all over, not only the state, but uh, the entire country and even the world to Milledgeville. Uh, the state hospital was founded in 1837. Uh, it was established by the Georgia State Legislature, uh, which at the time was just two miles from here in Milledgeville. The state capital uh, decided at that point that it would be necessary and beneficial to create a asylum for epileptics, lunatics, uh, alcoholics, uh, etc. And so all, all different manner of individuals were served here on this campus. The first patient actually arrived in 1842 
the campus officially opened uh, in 1839, and the first patient was a, a gentleman from Macon, Georgia, who actually came over by foot. His family rode in a horse-drawn cart. He was chained to the back of the cart and walked from Macon. He was considered to be uh, a danger not only to himself but of course to others and hence he walked uh, the 30 some odd miles from Macon. He was here treated for about six months or so at, at which point he passed from manic exhaustion which is a very clinical way of saying that uh, he crazied himself to death uh, here at Central State Hospital. Throughout its life the campus of course grew and it expanded tremendously. From its first patient in 1842 until the 1960s, the population exploded. In the 1960s, there were uh, approximately 13,000 patients being treated here on this campus, being treated for all manner of diseases and afflictions that we now know are very treatable with medication and counseling. We had a lot of individuals sent here for developmental disabilities, things that uh, now we, we, we prefer to treat people at home with. But this campus saw an incredible transition in the way that we treat mental illness in this country. We went from a custodial model where individuals were even counted on the census as inmates of the institution to a community treatment model. And so as the patient population shifted to other regional hospitals, Columbus, Savannah, there began to be less and less of a need for these buildings. And so here, even in the historic quad, you have buildings like the Walker Building, which has not been in use since the 1970s. This building was first shut down in 1977. These buildings have not been used in 40 plus years. Since the early to mid 2010s, there's been slowly a reduction in the use of this facility as they've transitioned to other buildings on campus. So at this point, there are no vital records left here. There, uh, there are no offices maintained in this building anymore and, and we're really at a, at a crossroads as to what to do with not just this building in particular but many parts of the campus in general. A 5,000 foot you know, overview, a, a bird's eye overview of the campus. It's over 2,000 acres, it's over 200 buildings ranging in age from the late 1800s to the uh, early 2000s and contrary to popular belief the, the hospital, the, the asylum is not actually shut down. There are still buildings on this campus that serve the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities, namely the Allen Building. One of the greatest achievements that we've had so far with, uh, with the campus and revitalization has been the repurposing of Central Kitchen. Central Kitchen at one point was serving approximately 33,000 meals per day. It's a massive facility. It has an acre of refrigerated storage, coolers that you could play football in. You know, just massive, massive facility. It's a 120,000 square foot facility, and we were able to work with USDA to find uh, loans to completely renovate it and bring it up to date as a modern state-of-the-art USDA certified facility. Food Service Partners is now operating that facility uh, and we're expected to create about 350 jobs uh, out of the kitchen. Uh, the Jones building was the original medical surgical building. It was built uh, in 1927, opened in 1928, and was in service until around 1976. The Jones building would have been your traditional hospital. When you think of a hospital, this is where they would have done procedures. This is where they would have done any sort of operations or procedures necessary to the health of the individuals. Most of the client care as far as psychological services, counseling, those would have been done in their own dorms and their own buildings closer to where the patients were but this would have been where you went if you had pneumonia or uh, needed x-rays that would have all been done in the Jones building one of the most unique things about the campus in regards to um, you know the construction and timeline of, of the campus is that it exists on such a, a wide backdrop of American social issues you have of course, it's founding at the very beginning where the first caretakers here in the facility were actually the superintendent and his slaves. They were the first ones to provide care here at the hospital. Through the Civil War into the turn of the, the century, huge leaps in medical science and advancements. Uh, and not only that, but also tremendous social changes as far as segregation and desegregation of the campus. Here in the historic quad, there were two buildings built 
uh, expressly for the purpose of separate segregated facilities. The Walker Building was the white male convalescent building. The building which stood opposite of it was the black male convalescent building. One of the first, or the first building in Baldwin County to be named for uh, an African American is uh, now part of Frank Scott State Prison, but previously it was part of the Central State Hospital, and that would be the Ingram Building. Mr. Ingram worked uh, at the State Hospital for many, many years. He retired from the State Hospital, and in his old age actually was treated here at the hospital. Um, the, the hospital had uh, five different units, including the forensics unit, uh, behavioral health. Let's see, I'm trying to think, trying to think, I'm trying to think, what else? I can, I can just go on forever, but... Any any murders here? I always ask this about asylums because there seem to always be a I, cluster of crimes. So of course, you know this this was a city unto itself, and like any other city, uh, it it had its own challenges. It had need for its own fire department, its own police department. There of course were occasionally some some violent incidences between patients, uh, individuals that were being treated here. I don't know enough about any any of those stories in particular to tell you the details of any. But of course there you know there there was a need for a police department. Sometimes there there were violent episodes, and that's why this place had its own police force. At one point, the population of Central State Hospital was greater than that of the city of Milledgeville. It's just a huge and fascinating campus. Again, my family has been here for many generations. Uh, I grew up in the shadow of the Jones Building, just on the other side of campus. My great-grandmother's house is just over there on Linden Court. Growing up, I, I spent a lot of time on this campus doing community activities. There were family appreciation days, employee appreciation days. I remember going to events in the auditorium. I remember going to cookouts here in the pecan orchard. My great-grandfather was a cook here at the state hospital. Both of my grandmothers were nurses. Both my mother and father worked in the Department of Corrections uh, in the prisons here. And now I'm here working with the Redevelopment Authority to try to revitalize this and bring jobs and opportunity back. There's, there's a million stories here, you know, there, at least. Uh, I can tell you that the oldest cemetery on the campus is Cedar Ridge Cemetery, which is at the, the very back of the campus uh, along Central Shop Road. There are no less than 25,000 individuals buried in Cedar Lane Cemetery. Cedar Lane at one point was a segregated cemetery. It was where white patients were buried. Jasmine Ridge would have been the, uh, the black patient cemetery. In the 1940s when they built the Rivers Complex they actually exhumed and moved about 2,500 black patient graves and at that point transferred them over to Cedar Lane. In the 1950s and the 1960s uh, by that point there was a contract with the Department of Corrections to maintain the graveyard, to maintain the cemetery. Well, without knowing what they were doing, the inmates thought it would be a lot easier to maintain the cemetery if all these metal stakes weren't spread out all over the ground. And so, not realizing that those stakes were markers for individual graves, they pulled up the metal markers, piled them into the woods, and cut the grass for another 40 years. It was the 1990s before these piles of stakes were discovered and there was any effort put together to try to determine where these individuals were. But of course, by that point, the graves, the markers were, were lost. There was no way of knowing what marker went in which plot, even if we could identify the plots. And so tragically, there are at least 20,000 graves that are unmarked. There's no way of telling where they are. So what, what was done was in the restoration in the 1990s, the markers that were able to be located were brought out and lined up in rows along the front side of, of the cemetery as a, as a reminder of the thousands that are interred there. A lot of people look at those markers spaced out as they are without realizing that those individuals are not buried there in one mass grave. Really, anywhere that you walk along the cemetery, you could very well be standing on someone's final resting place. There are a few graves that are marked with uh, a headstone or other marker that the family would have provided afterwards, but for many of these individuals, the only thing close to a marker is the metal stake with a, a lot number, uh, a patient number. That's, that's really all we have for them. It was 
uh, it was a consistent practice at Central State Hospital that anyone that was buried here, anyone that died here, was given a proper burial. They would have had a, a pastor or a priest or a rabbi to oversee their funeral service. There would have been a nurse. There would have been somebody that would have attended their funeral. Everyone here was buried with dignity and somebody to, to look over them. It's, it's unfortunate that there were so many that their own families would not claim their body after their passing, but uh, everyone that was served here was buried with dignity if they passed here. There are plenty of strange and interesting stories from around the campus, but none of them revolve around ghosts. Now, oftentimes we do get a lot of visitors here. There being three colleges here uh, in Milledgeville, there's no shortage of young men and young women who like to come out here on a on a weekend, uh, late night, Thursday or Friday, and try to make their way into a building and end up scaring themselves. You, know, you hear lots of stories about things like that, but I've been here for, for several years now and I've never experienced anything of the paranormal. There have been times where I've been in, in a building on a security check and have psyched myself out. You know, you hear a noise or you hear what sounds like a door opening or closing in a building that you know you're the only person there. Uh, and, and it's very easy to psych yourself out, but anything that was just beyond explanation, anything that was just had to be a ghost, nothing of the sort nothing like that. It's individuals looking for ghosts that create the most noises and disturbances, but never have I ever run across anything that was inexplicable. And I just want people to come and visit and keep a, a, a sense of respect about the campus. This is not a place to come to, you know, spook yourself out and be, be, be weirded out. You know, are there strange things? Yes. Again, most of them explained by people, but it's a place where there was more good work done than, than bad. There's a lot of good work done here by people that really cared a lot. All right, so obviously after you heard the interview, there's, there's probably a lot of things they don't want to talk about, uh, the abuse and, and different things like that, that it really isn't flattering to the facility. For us, we're, we're hoping that our video, we can kind of expose some of those things and or at least bring them to light, kind of the true history of the place. And you know, sometimes history is much darker than sometimes you can even imagine. I heard a noise behind us too. Oh, There's a bug. There's a bug. It's just a bug. Oh, it's crawling on me. <laughs> <laughs> now you see, this is where the episode gets really dark. So it's May now. We were in Georgia in March. And what you're about to see in here didn't happen to us until after we had filmed the interviews in the hallway that you're seeing, the interview with the city councilman, the investigation. This interview happened as we were leaving Central State Hospital the next day when we went to go visit the cemetery where the thousands of people are buried in unmarked graves. As Jeff and I were leaving, we actually saw a woman in scrubs sitting in the gazebo at the edge of the cemetery and we decided to ask her if she had ever heard of any ghost experiences or anything like that dealing with central state and what she told us was absolutely shocking now we noticed that while interviewing the councilman he didn't really go into depth about the abuse at the hospital he didn't go into depth about the deaths about the crazy psychiatric practices of the late 1800s early 1900s the electroshock therapy, the locking people in cages. And we had no idea what we were about to learn. So buckle your seatbelts. I'm gonna be posting this interview in its entirety on the channel this weekend. But for now, here are some of the highlights from our talk with a former nurse at Central State. My name is Tracy Towery. I am from Millsville, Georgia. I am 34 years old, 30, no, 42. <laughs> God almighty, I am so sorry. Okay. <laughs> so what do you do right now as a job? That's how we started our conversation. All right, here at this building, Bostick, I do either in the kitchen as dietary or sometimes I am on the floor as a correctional officer. And what is the facility? It is Bostick Nursing Center it is where they um, house prisoners it could be anywhere from criminally insane um, people on parole they can't be released because loved ones are deceased and they can't get out of the um, system so we house them here and what's the environment like in there nowadays 
I'm with the coronavirus. Everybody is on lockdown. They are no longer to have visitors. They can't leave the building. Um, normally their curfew is about 12. Um, so everybody stays on their own ward. Um, some days are good, some days are bad because they're cooped up. I mean, it could be anywhere from a smell to a noise to another resident fighting and they just all get into it. Time of high stress. Yes, very. It really is because nobody could go anywhere. They are in a long hallway. That's all they have. You told us before also that you used to work at Central State in some of the buildings? Yes, I worked at Central State. I was in the Craig Center. That's for children. Um, it could be from an accident where they choked on something. Some of them, the littler children, there was one in there that the mom put bleach in the milk and thought it would kill the baby because she was 16, but you know, they're usually a vegetable. So the Craig Center is mostly children. Um, I was in the Allen building. Um, that's criminally insane. Um, anywhere from, they could be in a room with just a slot for the trays, or they could actually be in a cage where they could be watched. And what did it feel like in those buildings before they were shut down? What was like the general kind of energy? Yes, the higher the floors you get, the more like chill bumps you'll get, um, you'll, you'll be paranoid, you think you're being watched. Um, it's really not very comfortable. Um, you totally always have to watch your back. Really couldn't even have pens or pencils. You couldn't have anything on you. It was high security. So it's a very intense. It definitely was not a laid back, comfortable feeling at all. Were there any people that were committed that had interesting stories that you can remember? One of the other co-workers, it's almost like the movie um, Hannibal Lecter. You could make an easy mistake if somebody has a pin in their pocket. There was one incident where the guy grabbed it through the cage and stabbed um, an employee in the neck with it. Um, a lot of cannibalism, a lot of pedophiles were in there. When you were working there, there was cannibalism? Yes. In what regard? Um, as far as killing people, putting the meat in spaghetti, um, bodies found in freezers, in their yards, skin hanging up. It, it was really um, uncomfortable. And those were the people you were treating? Yes. Working to treat? Yes. What, what were they like? Were they somewhat normal or were they kind of keep you on edge? They keep you on edge. Just the way they look at you, the way they talk, um, it really made you nervous. Was it a general kind of sense of stress between employees? Like it was kind of known to be just a high stressful environment to work in those buildings? Yes, absolutely. But you enjoyed it? I did enjoy. I, I try to help who I can help. Um, there's some that you really can't, but at least you could offer a word of kindness or treat them with respect. I've always liked risky jobs, I guess you could say. And nowadays those buildings are shut down? Yes, all of them. Is, how does that make you feel to see that? Relief. Really? Yes. For what reason? I don't have to go back in there. Really? I don't have to work night shift, I work night shift. So it's a whole different thing when everything's quiet and the stuff that went on there, you know, people were getting killed, people were getting mistreated. It was a very scary atmosphere at night. Um, at night, there's not as many people as there is day shift. So you really have to watch out for your well-being. You always heard something. There was always something around the corner, always something calling your name or felt like you're being followed. It was very stressful. So me and a friend of mine went in there on Halloween. It was we had badges to get in. Um, the other floors, of course, you, you think you hear doors creaking, feet, footsteps, you, you're basic. The higher you went. Um, can we, real quick too, can you explain what building you're talking about? Oh, of course. It's the Allen Building on Central State Grounds. Um, it's right next to the Green Building. The higher you get up, the more your body lets you know something is not right. You know, it's the tightness of breathing, you, you, your hands start sweating, and it's different, it's hard to breathe, it's so strong, um, the air is very heavy. We were going down the hallway, about the third door in, we passed it kind of quickly, and the light started flickering, you could hear the um, generator, uh, like it was starting, 
and it sounded like when somebody somebody was in there. So we went forward. Our mind really couldn't process what just happened. So we stepped back. At that time, we didn't see anything, but you could smell smoke. Um, it was a really foul smell. And so, of course, we ran out of there really quick to gather our thoughts to see what happened. But as we, were, we run down floors, it's almost like you hear prisoners scream, um, like cups being clinged on the bars. Um, after that, we were in the parking lot, probably a good 30 minutes, just looking at each other to figure out what in the world just happened. Did we see what we seen? Um, so we all parted ways. I had went home, took a shower, made sure my kids were getting ready for their stuff for school and homework. When I went in the shower, I lay down in the bed. I was very uncomfortable as far as laying there. I tried to close my eyes. So when I opened my eyes above the door frame, it was almost like a gargoyle looking creature. His arms were backwards, his legs were backwards, like almost like holding on to the door frame in the corner of the wall. I remember specifically, it was, it was gray, you could see the dark, but when it opened its eyes, it was almost like a reddish orange color. You could definitely feel you were in danger. So I had left my room running down the halls to check on my kids because I really wasn't sure what was going on. The kids were fine. When I was working my way back through the living room, I had a satellite, so it's not gonna cut on by itself. The TV would come on, it would just be nothing but blue. So I would turn it back off. By the time I got in my room, it had turned itself back on. So I just unplugged it. In my kitchen, for some odd reason, there's a big mirror in the kitchen, which my bedroom was connected to the kitchen. You could see a black shadow. I could definitely tell he was wearing like a top hat, just standing there. Um, I had tried to go in my room, could not unlock my door. So I went to my youngest son's room to check on him because he was a baby at the time. I could not get into his room. So being in the military, being correctional officer, I did get my gun out because I was really gonna shoot the doorknobs off because I did not know what was going on. So when I reached up to point at the doorknob, all the doors had opened um, and that was about it for that part. Um, you know, you're normal, you're hearing laughing, you think you're hearing kids. Uh, we have got on recording different type of growls. Um, so we ended up having to leave that house couldn't get nobody to come into it. They knew the history of it. We couldn't get no help, so I moved me and my children out of there for our safety. Wow. Can you also talk about the kind of devices that are left at Central State? Because we didn't really get to cover those yet. Okay, sure. Nobody really understood mental illness back then. So they had different devices that they would put them in to punish them. There is a wooden box that has just holes. It's an, enough for you to be in a fetal position. That's about it. I mean, if they continue to scream or misbehave, they had the same type of box, but it had spikes on it. Um, they have the table there where they did um, electric shock to see if they can't make people better. Um, they have, it looks like a coffin, but all you have is the eyes, where you can see the eyes. They'd put them in there. Um, in that building, it's alone. The only really thing you get is like the smell of urine and feces because they were left in there for, you know, days or maybe a couple of hours. A lot of them didn't really have clothing on. They um, was just in halls. I mean, it, it was really sad. But they didn't understand mental illness and they try to torture them to see if they could get them to be better. Um, they would really abuse them and hit them. They would punish them by not feeding them. It, it really was sad. And did you ever hear of any abuse when you worked there? Nobody really talks about it. Everybody is hush-hush and under the table. Nobody really says anything. But um, you do see it. I've always reported it. They said they would take care of it, but it, it was really never taken care of. And um, this was what years did you work there? I worked there from, let's see, 1997 till 2005. 
But at the end of the day, you worked with a lot of good people too, and there was a, you would say, an actual attempt to help people. Yes, there was an um, another nurse that worked there. She uh, really put a lot of effort into it. She really cared about them. You know, we always made sure that they were dressed nice, their hair was brushed, taught with respect. Not every shift was like that. And what, what's your best memory from working there? What's like a really positive thing you have to say about the experience? The excitement that not only does the adults have, but the children. They recognize, they might not communicate to you, but they recognize you when they see you. They, they, their hands will be hitting. If they're in wheelchairs, they get excited. They'll jump around, they'll hit the tables. Some of them will point um, because they know you're there to help them. Did you have any other people that you worked with that had any sort of paranormal experiences? While I was there, I, you know, I heard stories about somebody's hair being pulled, somebody being touched, doors being slammed on them. Um, a lot of them didn't like to go in the basement for supplies. They just always had a, like a rotten egg smell. It was like a sulfur smell. Um, so that's where a lot of the neglect come in because everybody was scared to go get the supplies they needed. But majority of us being touched, hair pulled, or hear their name being called and nobody being there. And this was when the building was active? Yes. People were having a lot of activity consistently? Yes. I can only imagine what it must be like in there now since people can't go in legally and yeah. haven't been able to for such a long time. Before the end of the shift, we do a walkthrough to make sure everybody's where they're supposed to be. Um, I always check the shower room, make sure nobody's hiding. Um, they will play hide and seek sometimes. Um, you can walk through there. The water will sometimes turn on on you. Um, you'll be yelled at to get out. Um, and it's so close, it's almost like you could feel the breath in your face telling you to get out. This is my home. You could be in the cafeteria sometimes. Um, then they had gas stove, a lot of everything was on gas. Sometimes it will be on or it will come on when you're walking there. Trays will fall on the floor. People serving, you know, you put your spoons, you get everything ready. Um, they'll fly across the room. Refrigerator will open. You come in, glass will be everywhere, plates will be everywhere, broken. It's almost like somebody took their hand and just went down the top of the serving thing. Glasses will break. Um, sometimes the, the resident may be drinking something, um, and it has been where it has busted in one of their hands. Toilets being flushed, names being called. Um, this is really about it, as far as I have personally seen. Wow, but I mean, it, that's like an insane amount of activity. Yes, it's Seems really like bad. It. Do you think management did a good job administering the actual buildings and the care of the patients? Absolutely not. If we ever had an emergency, a lot of times they wouldn't answer the phone or they'll get to it or write a report, um, but I've never seen any changes. I'm just shorter staff. And do you think that that's kind of why the buildings were eventually shuttered? I, I, w I would have to say that, yes. I'm pretty sure, you know, when the insurance people come in, Medicaid people come in, um, that's when inspections started coming in. I'm sure that had a lot to do with it. And you said you started believing in the paranormal when you were serving. Can yes. Can you talk about that for just a, a minute? Because that's so... <laughs> Thanks for your service, by the way. Thank you. Of course. They used the children to have bombs to come and kill us. And I hesitated. Um, like I said, I was a kid myself, and I hesitated to shoot them. Um, it's not something I wanted to do, but it was either me or them, so I made that choice. Wow. So paranormal activity has really kind of followed you. Yes, and I life. really have not been able to find out why. So as somebody that worked at Central State, you believe that there are things that happened there in the past that they really don't want to talk about and never really recorded? Yes. They closed it out, so almost, almost hush-hush, nobody knows nothing, nobody wants to say anything. So you really can't get anybody from the small town to talk about it, but I don't mind. I know what I've seen. I know how I felt. Um, there's no reason to be scared of it. Um, share your experiences because some people might think 
people are going to think they're crazy or laugh at them. But it's really not like that. I try to get people to open up and talk to them because you can almost tell the difference in their face. Something's wrong. Something happened. And you think that people are kind of afraid to talk about what they experienced because it was such a big employer? Yeah. You know, you, you didn't want it to get back to the main people. You definitely didn't want to talk about it because at that point in time, like you said, it was the main thing here in Georgia was Central State Hospital. You didn't want to lose your job. You didn't want nobody to think you're crazy. You didn't. You just kept everything to yourself. And you definitely couldn't talk about Central State outside of work. You know, you signed papers, waivers, everything. There was, you did not say anything. And you would definitely consider Central State to be haunted? Absolutely. Guaranteed. Well, great. Is there anything else you'd like to add? That's I, my, hand, my hand is literally going numb. That was, <laughs> that was such a good interview. Wow. So later that night, we wrapped our interview with Walter. We went in and checked in at our Airbnb and Jeff and I went to go have some fried chicken. We've been eating low carb this whole time. So we had just not a healthy meal, but a low carb meal with the chicken. And we came back to the Central State Complex. It was about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. And we instantly set out to set up our static cameras that we were going to leave inside some of the buildings that we were just not allowed to get into. And I want you to remember that we weren't allowed to go into one building inside of Central State. Not one of them was opened up to us. Okay, so where are we gonna head to? Okay, everybody. So we got these safety vests on because we had to go through a whole process to be able to film here at the Central State Hospital. Um, these are for security guards so they know that we're with the film crew and whatnot and Tonight we, we are just given unprecedented access to this complex. It's 200 buildings Absolutely massive, but we only have exteriors to film So right now we're going to start off this investigation by going to two different buildings and Placing static cameras inside of broken windows and we're just going to let those roll while we investigate the exteriors so it's very creepy out here once again if you appreciate what we do on the channel you can either help support the show by purchasing a piece of merchandise from our merch store he's been wearing our merch in almost every episode of this series here's our face mask we got the paranormal files official mask right there it's pretty badass Control, cool, actually. or you can become a patron and we're posting this whole trip we've been posting stuff every single day from every location, months before other people even know what we're filming, where we're filming, or some of the evidence that we've captured. So those are two ways you can help the channel. We, I do this full time as my job, my career, so every little thing helps that you guys do. But anyways, let's uh, buckle in and, and once again, head to building number one. <clears throat> None of this is to support me, so people know. I'm actually contributing quite a bit all the time to help of trips and so forth. So just so you know, I'm just here to have fun with Collins and help him. Well, without further ado, let's uh, let's head out. stop yeah. and go look there's a window you want to leave that running here's a flashlight
Well, this is so f***ing sick. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, you can really feel that cold air, man. Let's go over to that doorway. Man, this has got very, I think we could get murdered here vibes. Oh, yeah. This is kind of nice. Stairwell? Oh, yeah. This would be a great place for a static camera. Is there a way that we can somehow, we can't really reach a rep pod now, can we? Or... No. Let's go look at the front real quick, and then we can decide to put one here or in the front, because there's a really, oh, we've got really... two. We should leave a REM pod at one of them. That's a good one to leave there, I think. Same, I okay. agree. That would be a fucking total... And these are on bright. Okay, let's go. So we've isolated a few places where we can put the static cameras. Very, very creepy. We heard movement inside the building. I'm kind of sad we didn't bring the camera. But we're going to head to another building now and see if there's another static camera spot. So we left the camera in the car, but we did find this massive opening right here in the building. We're trying to decide. Oh, it's obviously bordered down. We can't go in. Yeah. We're obviously, we're, we're under the agreement that we don't do any inside entry, which we're not going to. But we could put a camera right here because this is technically outside. Yeah. Yeah. Um, eerie building over here for sure. Look inside of those windows and look at what you see. Yeah, look at this chair in here. Oh, a chair there too. Interesting. Yeah. Possible? We could put a REM pod right here. Yeah. That's a, that's an option. Go. We could also put a REM pod in that other hallway. Over there? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like, I think that's really cool. Yeah, but when we start investigating, okay, okay, it should be setting right here so we can shoot in here. So we're here at the other building. We've decided we're going to set up this static camera right here facing this open doorway. And we're actually going to start the investigation right here. But I'm going to turn on the static microphone. Roll can, on it. Can you maybe reach? The REM pod just from the door, I thought you went in, just reach it and it's like I'm not going to go in. I'm just going to set it up here. Look what it's done. I mean, it was doing nothing. Is that you in there? What the heck, I mean, what would that be? Can you stop? Can you stop? Man. Can you stop? Please stop and show us that you're there. Are there many of you there? Oh my god. Okay, what? Focus. Dude, I mean, it's kind of crazy. I mean, I just approached it and started to go off like that. Just randomly. So what? Look at what is. Can you stop? What if we walk away a little bit? Walk. One, two. What? Okay, we're gonna walk. We're gonna walk away. I mean, I don't get it. 
Here do I. I mean, it wasn't doing that. It was already on when I walked up there. Okay. Wow. We're going to just start off by investigating this whole building as a whole. This is the closest that we can get. Is there anybody here in this building? Can you make a noise if you're in there? Anybody here? Were you over by the rum pad? <laughs> rum pod? If you are, make it go off again. I mean, why stop now? Just step over here. Is there anybody over there in this building? Is there somebody in here? Can you knock on something, move something if you're in there? Let's move over here. How about over here? Is there anybody over here in this building? Anybody in here make a noise? Is this the chairs? Yeah. Hello? How's a good shot? Can you grab my hand? Get a shot here. Oh, we didn't really even go back here. What the hell is all those police sirens? We don't have anything else. This is really. Hello? What? What the hell? It's like a police chase. It's really like a police chase going on over there. There's a car. They're, they're chasing a the car. No way. Oh, there's three cops. That's a police chase caught on camera. What the hell? Is there anybody in any of these buildings? I'm leaving the static camera shooting right there. Ready to take off? Let's go to the other building. Yeah, okay. So after Kyle and I set up the static cameras, we decided to um, really explore the exterior of the buildings. Uh, you know, it's, it's really creepy actually, obviously, as you're, you're gonna see on film. And looking in the windows, the broken windows, especially the, the open doors that were broken down, uh, it, I wish we could go in, because it, it, it looks really creepy. And uh, overall, it's just, if you were here, and especially, uh, at the uh, in darkness it, it's it's really creepy so at the end of the day as you can see in that footage that that's it we didn't really capture anything that night at central state we didn't really manage to get what we wanted we didn't feel that energy coming from these buildings because we couldn't get inside any of them they didn't let us into a single one of the buildings and so after that last clip we really thought that that was going to be the end of the night and it really essentially was you know we thought that was the end 
Or at least we thought that that was the ending. But in reality, that was just the very beginning. just shot those interviews, we didn't think that we were going to have access all day to a building. We're actually inside of the chapel right now. There were tons of funerals that took place in here. Wow. So you think something followed you home from this specific place right here? It's never happened to me before, ever in my life. Is there anybody here with us? Can you let us know where you are? Boy, kill. Walk towards the sound of my voice. Hello! <laughs> 